Hey, it's Scott Garlis at Stansberry Research. I'm here at the 2019 Alliance Conference in Las Vegas. I'm with John Tammany, Director, Center for Economic Freedom at FreedomWorks. John? Thanks for Thank having you. me. Yes. Thanks for being here. So during your presentation, um, one of the things you spoke about, you argued the Fed's power is overstated. Um, but aren't benchmark interest rates crucial to the cost of capital and economic output? Uh, sure, but I don't think the Fed influences them very much. And, and even if it could, it doesn't alter the reality that in Silicon Valley, if you want to get a loan for your business, there will be no loans because everything out there fails and so you can't lend toward what's not going to be around to pay back. It doesn't alter the reality in Hollywood that, that it's incredibly difficult to get a movie made. It doesn't alter the reality that for investment bankers trying to fund, trying to get finance for a new startup or an existing business, that the act of accessing capital is incredibly difficult. So my point is, and this is a positive one, talk about benchmark and all these different things. In the real economy, everyone's got a different interest rate and its credit is usually very difficult and the Fed cannot alter that reality. So we can focus on, on benchmarks and all that. They've been lower across the board in Japan for decades. What does it mean? It doesn't mean much. Uh, back when the, the Fed was at the zero rate, uh, half of U.S. small businesses could not get any credit at all. And it's just it's a reminder that's generally a positive statement too. In order to access the economy's resources, you have to have be viewed as a worthwhile, as, as, as something that has, has the ability to, to pay it back. And the Fed cannot alter that reality. Let's never forget, we're not, when we borrow dollars, we're not borrowing dollars. We're borrowing what dollars can be exchanged for computers trucks, tractors, desks, chairs, buildings, office space, most of all human resources. The Fed cannot increase that or shrink that. That's fair. Do you think the Fed has a use as a lender of last resort? No, it, and because it cannot be a lender of last resort and it can't simply because there's already a huge and very diverse market for well-run solvent banks that suddenly run into a cash crunch. There are so many private sector lenders out there who will easily open up a credit line to a well-run bank, at which point the Fed exists and has existed as a lender of last resort to insolvent banks for the past 106 years. Think about how damaging that is to the banking system. Think about what Silicon Valley would be like if there were a central authority laying in wait every time a web van or, or an e-toys or the globe.com fails to prop it up. Silicon Valley would be a microscopic fraction of what it is today. It's the failure that drives progress in any industry. And so the Fed can't be a lender of last resort because it can only be there for the bit for the banks that should be allowed to go under. Do you think the government made mistakes during the financial crisis in, in terms of bailing out some of these guys that were 25 times levered and that they made bad financial decisions? And then they should have just let these guys suffer the consequences, more or less? Oh, without, without question, and that's because I love Wall Street. If you love Wall Street and if you love finance, you've got to let poorly run institutions suffer their fate. And this idea that it was going to lead to the mother of all recessions, oh, please. That's just not a serious argument. Look at Japan and Germany after World War II, literally reduced to rubble, everything destroyed, but most trouble, difficult of all for them, they lost, each lost a generation of their best and brightest future achievers in their country. But with their, both economies relatively free afterwards, their growth was rapid and they turned things around. The idea that we can't survive the failure of Citibank, a bank that the Fed has, has, has bailed out five times in 26 years, the idea that that would have shut us down for decades is such an insult to common sense. And I'm surprised to this day, people dislike Ben Bernanke for all sorts of different reasons. Where are the major critiques from people up high saying, how, look at what he did and said back then. It was, it was so dishonest and so untrue. And where are the, the very negative books go, going after President Bush, going after President Obama, going after politicians who said markets aren't working, we're going to intervene in them. How much did they set us back? Markets just are. And when they're correcting, that's a sign. That's them setting the stage for growth because you're getting rid of what's not working. And government stepped in with predictable results. I'll, I'll go to my grave saying that there was never a financial crisis in 2008. What there was was a crisis of intervention. Failure could never cause a crisis. Interesting.
Um, is there a form of monetary policy you think could work? Uh, the form of monetary policy that could work is, a, is once again, in a perfect world, one of non-intervention. Let's never forget that money is just an agreement about value. Adam Smith, it was a throwaway line for him in, in, in Wealth of Nations. He said the sole use of money is to circulate consumable goods. Money is what private individuals created long ago, long before central banks, long before U.S. Treasuries, anything like that. We need something that we agree on about in terms of value so that we can exchange things. I've got bread, I want your wine, you want the butcher's meat. We need some kind of agreement about value. And so assuming the U.S. Treasuries announced tomorrow we, we renounce the dollar, the U.S. would still be the richest country on earth, and very quickly dollar substitutes would enter the marketplace because if uh, an economy that can create the supercomputer that sits in our pocket in, the, in terms of an iPhone can easily produce an agreement about value. And so in my perfect world, I would just say, yeah, just let, get the government out of the way and watch pr the private sector. There'd be JP Morgan, Wal Walmart dollars, there'd be all sorts of private dollars that we would say, okay, we accept that, that th those, and, and businesses would say, oh yeah, we accept Walmart dollars. And so suddenly we'd be circulating them. And, and Walmart could not devalue as the U.S. Treasury has historically done because if Walmart devalues you, if it robs us of our work, then we go to someone else. But right now, Treasury is the monopoly issuer, essentially. And so that's my perfect world if, if, if everyone were sane. Barring that, you know, it would be nice if the U.S. Treasury had more of a what's the word, more of a humble view of itself, that money once again is an agreement about value. You return to some kind of gold-defined dollar. This would in no way limit the supply of dollars. Just say the dollar, in our estimation, we redeem it at, let's just throw out a number, one one-thousandth of an ounce of gold. And going forward, and so I think even with, from that, market actors would gradually produce dollar substitutes, would say this is a dollar equivalent to liquefy the economy, but something much more humble. Interesting. Uh, and could the Fed be reformed and is something that's more useful for the economy? No, I don't think so, and I don't, I don't mean that in flippant fashion. The Fed serves no useful purpose. It can't be a lender of last resort. It can't be a regulator, and that's not a knock on the Fed. Again, if you could see around the corner as a regulator and detect trouble spots in the future, you wouldn't work as a regulator. You'd be a very successful investor, earning tens of millions, billions of dollars a year. We don't need the Fed to set an interest rates the most important price in the world. Why on earth would we want a non-market institution trying to influence that? And so the Fed keeps looking. The Fed's implicitly acknowledging what no one wants to, that its relevance is in decline. I mean, look, look at QE. Look at all the effort the Fed did to achieve less than nothing. And so the Fed's trying to get into real-time payments. It's looking for all sorts of ways, as all bureaucracies do, to remain relevant. But the answer is that you just don't need it, and you never needed it. And what's going to be really interesting is uh, the prospect of potentially taking the balance sheet back up that's being discussed. And uh, it, you know, this as the economy's doing well and the market's near all-time highs and they're going to be throwing more money at the system, it, it doesn't seem like it makes a lot of sense. No, no, but the politicians love the idea of the Fed stepping in, and Fed, the Fed loves the idea of stepping in and saving the economy. Oh, look at what we did. But that's the last thing you'd want to do. Even if the Fed could prop up the economy, how dangerous, because what that is, when an economy's correcting, all it's doing is basically saying in sports terms, Mike Shula, you didn't work out, we're hiring Nick Saban. And so what if, if there were always a central bank to prop up the economy during bad times? It just means that businesses making bad decisions, individuals making bad decisions, could keep making those bad decisions that are holding them down. But we know in the real economy that you get growth, that businesses grow precisely because they rush toward their mistakes. Pixar Studios, the most successful movie studio in the world, they're terrified when movies are going well because they know they're missing something. Their view is that all of our movies are terrible and then we fix them. We rush toward our errors constantly. The very notion of the Fed stepping in to help the economy is it propping up what's not working. The mistakes in the economy are always made during, during the boom periods. All a recession is is an acknowledgement where people are correcting them. Never get in the way of them. To get in the way of them is to fight recovery. Fair. And then do you think uh, part of the Fed's power is that people believe in it? 
I, yes, I think it's true. The Fed people do believe in it. I don't believe that the markets believe in it. I think if you look throughout history, there's the, there's all these ideas. Well, the Greenspan put, oh yeah, that worked in '87 and '98 when the economy is good. But how did it work in 2001? And how did the Bernanke put work in 2008? There's this notion that the Fed can alter market outcomes. No, it can't. And so we believe that the Fed can make and central banks can create good market outcomes. Oh, really, what happened in Japan? Because they've been trying this for years, and, and the market is still roughly half of what it was in 1989. Good businesses run by brilliant people lead to good market outcomes. The Fed can't change Amazon. It can't make Apple stronger. It can't make Google a more effective search engine and all the different things it does. And so, no, there's just there's no reason to presume that, this, that we can get a better outcome from this. And uh, let, let's stop insulting the U.S. economy by saying, oh, yeah, but see, the Fed, uh, if the Fed does these certain things, we'll, we'll be better off. No. Very interesting stuff. Thank you for your time. Thanks for having me. Certainly. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for more interviews and updates.